Um, you know, that uh, Ron Minnick at Google, now at Google, formerly was with Los Alamos National Labs. And are we getting a lot of feedback? Maybe should I just use the lectern mic? Okay, so uh, when Ron Minnick was at uh, Los, Alamos, Los Alamos National Labs, they built uh, the world's third fastest supercomputer using Linux in the BIOS uh, to be able to boot it and configure it. Linux BIOS uh, ended up turning into Core Boot, which is now running in every Chromebook so that they can have uh, this flexible, secure uh, firmware. Meanwhile, in the, uh, the, the sort of more normal PC space, the IBM BIOS turned into uh, EFI and then UEFI. And that was about 20 years ago that that came about. And it's pretty complex. It has a lot of sort of what we would call second system effect, where they're trying to be all things to all people. Um, as uh, uh, Alex mentioned in the U-Boot talk, there's a lot of uh, complexity in the way they've designed their linking model, the way things interoperate. Um, and we don't think that complexity, is, that complexity is necessary. We think we can replace that with, uh, with the Linux kernel um, to do all of the uh, device initialization, to locate the user kernel, whether it's on disk, on the network, or some other means, and then use the KXX system call to be able to start it. Um, we are keeping some parts of, uh, of UEFI, specifically the parts that do the proprietary uh, memory controller and CPU interconnect and some of the initial uh, bring up that's not published. And for that, we're using a package uh, from Intel, the firmware support package, where they've provided a binary blob that does that initialization. And because they've packaged all of that up, we can take over with a fairly well-configured machine that has paging, that has memory, that has long mode. We're, we're pretty much ready to go. So we've been able to port it to some commodity mainboards like the, uh, the Intel S2600 reference platform, as well as a lot of the open compute uh, systems. And the open compute project has this idea that hardware schematics should be available so that people can build the systems for their own needs. And at their uh, annual summit a few months ago, they announced that they feel that system firmware should also have a similar openness. So Linux Boot was uh, part of their um, uh, open system firmware, and we're really glad to be supporting that. We've also been accepted by the uh, Linux Foundation as, as a project. Um, so we can use the, uh, the Tux Penguin and the, and the Linux name. And we've held a lot of uh, hackathons to try to build some community. Uh, this one was hosted by uh, Google, and we had folks from Facebook, uh, from IT Renew, from, uh, from my firm, and we, we ported to uh, a bunch of main boards um, in this, uh, just spread out on the conference room there. So that's what is Linux boot. The why question, uh, in my mind, has, has three uh, pillars, the security, the flexibility, and the resiliency of it. Um, security is my focus. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work on uh, firmware security over the past few years and working with vendors to try to improve it. And one of the key things that we can do with Linux Boot is minimize the attack surface. We can't get rid of the attack surface, but we can greatly reduce it. But if we go back to the slide, and I'm convinced that every uh, UEFI presentation must include this, uh, this chart, there's this big stack of device drivers, um, which again, as Alex pointed out, are um, of varying quality. On the Intel S2600, there are 480 of them uh, in, in that firmware. And they do a lot of things like load uh, option ROMs uh, from devices, which is really bad from a security perspective. Uh, they do a lot of things like display uh, the, uh, the splash screen and people have fuzzed these various uh, JPEG decoders and found vulnerabilities. <coughs> there are things for legacy operating systems that we don't care about in uh, sort of the more modern era. Uh, there are also an entire IP stack that has not received the same sort of scrutiny and uh, exercise that the Linux stack has received.
Um, there are drivers for devices that no longer matter. And that represents an attack surface. As we saw in the Zen floppy drive attack a few years ago, you know, no one, people aren't testing that, uh, those code paths. And speaking of code paths that have not been tested recently, when do you think the Y2K rollover code was last uh, exercised? Yes, uh, it, it's, it really comes down to what do you trust? Um, so another part of this, uh, th this complex diagram is this final OS loader, which on most of our systems is going to be Grub. And Grub has basically an entire OS of its own in, inside that, that user interface. Um, it has file system drivers, it has uh, video drivers, it has network drivers. And all totaled, it's about a quarter million lines of code over a thousand files. And it's not that, uh, uh, that I'm concerned about the number of lines of code, but do we even need that code? That if we can use the Linux drivers for this, we don't need uh, th these other, uh, other implementations. So if we look at these three projects on, on uh, GitHub, um, we can see that you know, Linux has definitely had uh, a lot more activity. It does have issues. You know, I'm not going to dispute that. But they're actively being uh, fixed. They're actively being looked at by people. Um, it's had a lot more contributors. And you know, it was uh, definitely a much more rapid response to, uh, to issues. So going to your point, you know, who do we trust? Um, we can't trust uh, no one. You know, as, as Windows Snyder said in her uh, Hack in the Box talk, you know, we can't reduce our dependencies to zero. We're always going to have someone that we depend on. So we need to be able to reduce that number down to a, a smaller, smaller number of parties. Um, I don't feel that we can trust the OEMs. You know, they've been doing things in the firmware that are pretty shady, uh, where they are installing rootkits uh, into the operating systems. We know that governments uh, are using uh, UEFI rootkits as a place to get persistence uh, outside of the operating system. But more importantly, we can't fix problems ourselves. In fact, most OEMs don't fix problems either because they don't actually write the firmware themselves. They license it from uh, either the ODM or from the, uh, the independent BIOS vendor. And this means that systems, uh, once they've been shipped, typically never receive firmware updates. So if there's a security vulnerability, it's going to be there as long as that system is in use. And we need the ability to fix these problems on our own. We, we need this, this self-help uh, capability. Uh, the other problem with trust is we need a way to verify what we're actually running. Um, you know, we need to think of what can we verify. Uh, with things like uh, open source, we can, we can cryptographically sign all of our commits. So we can verify that uh, who is doing them, when, when did they go in. We can verify cryptographic signatures on all of our packages. Uh, we can verify hashes of uh, the packages that we download. We're also working on, on the uh, Linux boot project of ensuring that it's reproducible. So if you check out uh, one of the release tags and, and run make, you should get exactly the same bit-for-bit uh, -bit identical version uh, that we get, no matter what uh, sort of Linux you're building on. Um, and we have, as part of our continuous integration, something that logs all of these hashes so that other people can independently validate that. The other thing that Linux gives us is a lot more flexibility compared to these vendor systems. Um, and part of that flexibility comes from what Ron pointed out, that Linux Boot lets all of our Linux developers become firmware engineers. That suddenly, if you know how to build Linux, um, you can modify the way the firmware operates by editing uh, familiar shell scripts. You can configure the firmware with uh, kconfig so that you know, the same way you would build a regular Linux kernel. And because it's Linux, we have all the device drivers that Linux has. We have all the file systems. So if you want to boot off a encrypted ZFS drive, you can do that, which is not something you can do with, with any of the closed source uh, firmwares. Flexibility also lets us tailor to different threat models. 
Uh, as Steph points out in her, in her uh, security trainings, your threat model is not my threat model, but you know, your threat model is, is, is okay for, for what you need to protect. Um, and being able to tailor the system to reduce that attack surface, to install the, the drivers that we need is a key flexibility uh, that we get from Linux. With Linux Boot right now, we have uh, a few different runtimes. The one I work on uh, is called Heads, and it's f focused mostly on laptops um, and looking at how can we use all of the security features in laptops and commodity laptops to build a slightly more secure uh, system. Uh, the Google team is working on another one. Ron presented it at um, Embedded Linux conference a little while ago. Uh, it's written entirely in Go. Uh, Go is very popular at Google, um, so this is an easy way for them to get developers to work on firmware uh, uh, inside, of, inside of Google. And even though they're doing a just-in-time compiled uh, system, they've been able to reduce the boot time of these, uh, their servers pretty dramatically. And, and that's, that's an, a good uh, feature, um, especially for companies like Facebook that are looking at using Linux boot on some of their switches. Because switches these days are just x86 computers connected to the, uh, uh, the switch fabric. And they need the ability to reboot, to reprovision these very quickly. The stock firmware takes a long time, multiple minutes to boot. Uh, Linux boot can start um, uh, routing packets in about 20 seconds. So that, that's, a, that's a nice capability. Um, there we go. In addition to building you know, these secure, flexible systems, we want them to be resilient to different types of failures and different types of attacks. Um, something Matthew Garrett asked us to consider uh, in his CCC talk is how do we know that the, the CPU is actually running the code that we flashed on it, um, you know, that, that we think we built. And you know, our solution to that is to use a static root of trust because we can reason about it, it's, it's straightforward, and we can measure everything into uh, the TPMs that all, most commodity systems have these days. Uh, the TPMs have not been very popular in a lot of the free software community. And uh, things like attestation have been uh, dirty words to a lot of folks in, this, um, in, in the, the open source world. But it's a great security feature if we control the root of trust, because we can have our machines attest to us uh, through these mechanisms that they're running the firmware that we've built that is the firmware that we believe that we've uh, installed on, onto there. And because of that, folks, uh, like the EFF are looking at how do we, you know, how do we get this level of trust in our machines, and they're recommending that these sort of attestation features um, become useful, uh, become used if you're crossing borders. In the server side, uh, there are groups at MIT and uh, Boston University that just published a paper about using the TPMs in a cloud server so that they can attest uh, both to the cloud provider, to the cloud tenant and then to the user of the services running in that cloud, uh, that they are actually running the firmware, the OS, and the, uh, the configuration that um, the vendor says that they are. So we're measuring most everything, but unfortunately, you know, as uh, Johanna Rutowska points out, there's a lot of problems with mutable state in these systems. You know, every device that we have in, in the machine has some sort of firmware. Um, you know, the, uh, NICs, the GPUs, the SSDs, even the power supplies. You know, if it's more complex than a resistor, it probably has programmable firmware. Um, and this is a huge risk. Uh, you know, White Quarks joked that uh, our PCs are just a, a bunch of embedded systems in a trench coat, and we really need to start treating all of these different parts with the same level of scrutiny that we're giving uh, the, the main CPU and the firmware and the software that runs on it. We're trying to follow the, uh, the NIST guidelines on, on uh, how to keep track of these devices. Um, this, uh, they just recently published the final version of this, and it's, it's well worth reading if you're, if you're thinking about how do we deal with all of these different embedded systems in, in our uh, machines. The, the other big goal that we want is uh, pre preventing persistence. We know systems are going to get broken into people will get runtime code execution on the machines. So how do we prevent them from staying there? 
If you're a big hyperscale company, you can design a custom coprocessor like the, the Titan. Um, on commodity systems, uh, Intel has a, a new feature where the CPU can verify the firmware before it comes out of reset. This unfortunately can be used to lock the machine down to prevent users from installing their own firmware. But in the right mode, it actually uh, it, it can protect the machines. Um, luckily, there are some friendly, uh, uh, friendly voices inside of Intel that we're working with to try to get more documentation on exactly how we can make use of this. Uh, until then, um, uh, we, they just published a, a CVE that allows you to uh, jailbreak uh, your boot-guarded machine to put your own firmware on there. Uh, we're also, because we have Linux, we can take advantage of fancy things like GPG and hardware tokens to do this sort of validation as well on a more commodity level. Um, and you know, it's just Linux, so we can have a simple shell script that does that verification for us. Um, we can use features like DM Verity that, uh, to build um, uh, read-only root file systems. And we can pass that root of trust from the uh, sealed secrets in the TPM down to the, uh, the, the, app, uh, excuse me, the OS that we, uh, we k-exec into. On the Heads project, we're also working with uh, the folks on the Cubes OS to try to build um, a reasonably secure operating system. And they recognize that firmware is a huge risk. So they're, they're requiring uh, open source uh, firmware to receive their hardware compatibility. Um, another place that we're really concerned about, things like system management mode. Again, it's a great place for uh, malware to hide. Um, the uh, Intel uh, Advanced Threat Research has given a bunch of really great demos of uh, hypervisor escapes through SMM exploits. Um, our approach has been to re-vector these, uh, th these SMM handlers into, into the Linux kernel. Uh, optionally. Um, you know, this is a flexible system, so if you want regular SMM, you can still use it. Uh, the management engine is another dangerous uh, you know, rootkit inside our CPU. It's got a full OS in there, network connectivity, all sorts of scary stuff. Um, it has had both remote and local uh, code execution attacks. So one of the things that we're doing uh, as part of our research is figuring out how to turn it off and how to uh, reduce the attack surface that the ME is presenting to the world. Um, uh, Nicola Corona's uh, ME cleaner uh, works with Linux boot to be able to turn off the ME once it has booted the CPU. But the ME is not the only uh, sort of rootkit that we're worried about inside the machine. The board management controller also on servers is very well connected. It can DMA into memory, it's on the network, uh, it can snoop the VGA bus, it can talk to the power supplies, it's got USB, serial, uh, spy flashes, and it can talk to the TPM and circumvent uh, your roots of trust. So this is a very overprivileged uh, device um, and we need to move our free software onto there as well. Uh, Google excuse me, uh, Facebook and IBM have the OpenBMC project that, that does exactly that. It's a Yocto-based Linux distribution that runs on the BMC. And then we're also working on a uh, Linux boot-inspired one called MicroBMC that currently runs on some of the uh, open compute hardware. If you want to get started with Linux boot, uh, you can go buy one of the commodity systems that, uh, that we support, pull out your flash programmer and, and have fun. Uh, you can buy one of the, uh, one of the uh, OCP systems. They uh, have nice ZIF sockets, so you can more easily flash things. Um, but for large scale, uh, you know, we need to start thinking about how do we do continuous integration testing? How do we deploy this uh, across, you know, at, at hyperscale? And so I want to hand it over to Jean-Marie to discuss that. Thank you, Brad. It is going to work. Yeah, it seems to work. Um, so thank you, Tran. Um, my company is, um, is probably the one who's, who has shipped the most uh, Linux boot systems since the beginning of the project. So we just break 1,000 units. So that's still not a lot. But when you think about servers, that's, that's still a lot of units. And um, part of our job is to ensure that we are shipping systems which can be used by our end users.
in a safe way, in a secure way. And um, pretty quickly, when we look at the project, we thought that uh, one of the key advantage of Linux boot, which is Linux, the Linux kernel, was to be able to uh, develop a CI for uh, system bias novel firmware, so which doesn't really exist up to now. So I don't know if you ever had discussed with um, a system bias on uh, x86 platform uh, engineers, but they are just running testing, they are combining that stuff, running testing by hand and say it works or it doesn't work. But that doesn't scale, especially when you want to work at, um, uh, uh, through a community project and we, we thought that it was probably a good idea to try to avoid to fix bugs in production like we do for many years in system bios. So, and th this, this is um, one of the biggest challenges we try to address today with the CI. So, um, as I said, uh, that's the common tools that uh, currently system buyers are using. So that's a flash programmers uh, removing the chip from the zip sockets and putting it back to the, to the server. So the whole process takes about 15 minutes and you have um, a high percentage of chance to kill one of these chips during the day. And this, this is just stressing the engineers and, and, and he lose a lot of time, so in the end. And uh, on the right hand side, you got the uh, EMI debug card. I'm still trying to figure out uh, how it could be useful. So we have a couple at the office, but we never find the right way to make it work uh, to get something interesting out of that. So, um, so we started the Linux Boot Continuous Integration Platform project about um, nine months ago. So the, the main goal is to test that Linux Boot works. Uh, so first we compile uh, Linux Boot from scratch we are able to have a replicable build. So this was the key, uh, uh, the, one of the key requirements. Uh, we have a uh, fully automatic testing at firmware level and we want to run on real hardware, which is key. And everything uh, fully automatized. So without having somebody trying to push a button and go uh, heading to a menu and uh, selecting the, uh, the features that you want to test. And uh, we are also focused on uh, trying to support multiple hardware generation. And the, the project right now is mostly focused on uh, the open compute hardware. So that's because we can get access to the schematics and, uh, and the various drawings that we, we need to support properly Linux boot. So the, the way the, the CI works is a traditional way. So we, we do have a web API. And the main goal is to interconnect that API with the GitHub account from the Linux boot. And each time we will get a pull request, we will have the capability to run the full process and provide back feedback to the, uh, to the GitHub uh, pull request status, uh, telling if it works or not, and getting, uh, getting the, the run feedback. So that's, that's really key. So we have a job controllers, and we, we have something that we call the builder. Um, so the builder could be run on circle CI or a traditional uh, CI environment. One of the issues we faced was build time. So luckily, uh, the community works pretty hard on the parallel build time. But we, we, are, we are building also the operating system images and validating that everything works on our build. And we see that we have quickly discovered that some of our build time could go up to four hours, which is quite a lot on 20 cores. And uh, we decided to keep that, that element part of the CI instead of using the, uh, the common available CI uh, from, the, from the market. Then we go through the not break validation. So that's a very important thing. Up to now within the Linux boot, so when we, we were able to compile and get a binary and run through QEMU, we were pretty happy about that. But we quickly discovered that it was really key to boot on real hardware. And this is what the not break validation is doing. So we, we upload the newly built image firmware on the flash emulators, which is connected directly to a motherboard. And then we are able to turn on that board and see uh, if, it, if it's able to build the firmware or not. And uh, if it's able to build the firmware, then we, we run basic um, validation. So roughly we check if um, a CPI table are properly set up, if NUMA uh, is properly set up, all the, the low level infrastructure is there if the PCI Express works and, and all the, the various buses. And then we, we decided to go up to OS stability and stress test. So we are testing OS installation for various, um, uh, various way. So either through USB network booting or um, NVMe booting. 
So we thought it was really key because we, we quickly discovered that uh, we might have some regressions depending on the build. And we are also checking that we are integrating all the device drivers which are requested uh, to support a specific hardware platform. So the implementation, uh, um, I should have mentioned that all this works is open source. So if you want to participate, feel free, and that's on GitHub. You can get access to hardware. So the hardware is currently hosted uh, in France, in data for data centers. So we are currently opening uh, one data center uh, in California. So that's because we, we do have some community members there, and they are complaining about the latency to reach friends from California. And whatever we can do, we cannot reduce that. So that's the, that's the thing. So, and uh, we are expanding the, the CI there. Um, so um, just to provide you some insight uh, of, uh, regarding the CI. So everything is, um, is managed through Ansible. So who knows Ansible in the room? Well, at least people know it. So that, that's an automatic tool to um, deploy the same software configuration on a bunch of hardware platforms. So just to be sure that the system configuration is the same everywhere. So if you know Ansible, so you can, you can participate to the uh, basic system setup of the Linux boot uh, con uh, CI configuration. Uh, we, we have redundancy and scalability tests uh, running, and we are using Slurm to, as a batch scheduler for uh, the jobs. And uh, we, we just need roughly to set up a Linux boot uh, CI for nodes. So we wanted to keep the infrastructure small. That's because we are thinking that some ODMs might be interested to run their own CI in-house. And when you are developing a new generation of chips, and you have to develop your uh, system BIOS, you don't want to use a public CI and just validate that everything works on prototypes. And we, we wanted to have uh, the freedom to offer the capacity to test new hardware without being dependent on something which is available on the internet. So the, the web API is able to launch job and uh, query status and uh, uh, providing job blogs, so something pretty common through the web API for a CI. Uh, the job controllers allocate the jobs, and um, we, we offer um, a specific way to build jobs. So roughly, we decided to use VMs to build the jobs, and the developers are free to define the VMs needs that they have. If you need less than 40 gigabytes of my memory, everything will happen in memory. So we have built servers with a bunch of memory, up to 256 gigabytes, and you can build on top of that. And uh, you get free access to the internet, and, and you can get even uh, remote access to the VM if something goes wrong during the build, just to avoid that we restart the whole process from scratch. So keep in mind that some of the build might be uh, extremely long. And we initiate the job execution for the job controllers. So the builder is based on the work that Tram is running at um, uh, to Sigma. Uh, so this is based on. Um, on the HIDS uh, build process, and we are building currently the NERF image or the BusyBox image, so which is the user space environment for uh, Linux boot. And uh, we, we are also able to control uh, what kind of Dixie drivers we want to keep within the final Linux boot image. So, um, up to now, we are mostly removing all of them. We, we have to keep a few of them, uh, like the SCPI table generation, which is not yet uploaded to the user space. So, but we are targeting to work on that uh, within the next couple of months or years. I don't know yet when we will start to work on this. <laughs> and uh, and we, we can generate a final Linux boot image. Uh, just for IP protections, so in some cases we are unable to provide back the image directly to the end users. So the image is, um, is standing within the, the CI process and is loaded to a server which has been designed to run that image. So that's because we rely on the UEFI uh, existing implementation, which, uh, which is still running some codes from Intel and EMI, and we are stripping it down to the very basic level of features that we need. So we, we don't want to enter into a, a, a very complex debate with, uh, with them. So the NodeBrick validation is based on this architecture. So this is one of the, the core value that we set up. So we, we do have um, a Linux boot CI client. So this is the target node. This is where we are going to load the, uh, the Linux boot image. And we have the, the controller node. So this is where we are building the, uh, the image. And when the image is ready, 
So we, we get connected to uh, a Deadly Pro Gehem 100 Pro. So who knows that device? Uh, not that many people. So that's a, that's a flash emulator. So roughly you can connect that device to a motherboard directly to a spy bus and uh, you can remove the flash. So it's, it's going to, re, uh, to answer to all the read and write requests. And uh, that's, uh, that's pretty useful because you can upload directly on that device in less than one, one or two seconds new firmware image and you can reprogram in, in a very fast way uh, a target machine. And uh, so we upload the image and then we are able to turn on, turn off, reset the systems. We can uh, run out power uh, reset either. And uh, if something goes wrong, so we, we, can, we can keep the control on the target node. And then we also have um, serial console feedback to the controller node, so we can see the boot happening. And we, we also connect uh, a USB programmable switch just to test the operating system boot. So let's, let's imagine that everything goes well, the firmware boots, and we want to check that we are able to boot Ubuntu or any uh, uh, Linux flavors. So we, we are targeting first uh, in, uh, USB installer image, and then we are testing also PIXI installer image through either RG45 or 10 gigabit Ethernet adapter. So everything is uh, fully integrated. So that's, that's not only a bunch of wires. And uh, I just realized that I should have had a, a picture of the real hardware, because it does exist. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and this is roughly what, what we are building and we are scaling right now uh, for uh, supporting Linux boot development. One of the key benefits is that you, you don't need to have any human intervention to run and test everything at firmware level when you are using this, uh, this process. And that's really key if we want to be sure that regression testing are, are, fully, up, are fully run and uh, if we want to simulate or emulate any potential firmware attacks or whatever, so that's, the, that's, the, that, that's, that's really important to us. Um, so the basic features validation, this is at operating system level, so when the OS is started, and we are testing also that, uh, I should spoke about that, so that's the things, the Pixie boot works, and that the console works, and that we, we can run on NVMe. Um, one thing I didn't mention, so most of the hardware we are getting are, is recertified hardware. So it's coming up with an uh, aging system BIOS. And one of the main benefits to use Linux boot, for example, has been to enhance uh, the hardware support for uh, some of the hardware. Um, a quick example, so if you have um, a Xeon V2 of these three uh, servers, it was unable to boot on NVMe drives because it was lacking the device drivers within the firmware image built by the ODMs. And the ODMs doesn't have any interest to update that firmware image because they want you to purchase a new machine. So uh, with Linux Boot, we have the capacity to integrate uh, the NVMe drivers at the firmware level interface, and we, we are able to support NVMe Boot on uh, edging systems. So the end user has more freedom to decide uh, what kind of features he wants to activate on uh, his own hardware. So the stability and stress test are uh, something which is really important. So a lot of firmware engineers believe that when the firmware is started, everything is fine. So, and uh, most of the time they forgot to discuss with the operating system engineers just to validate that everything is fine. And then there is a lot of debate between the operating system engineers and the firmwares to know from where the issue is coming, and most of the time it's always coming from the hardware. So, and, uh, and, and we, are running, uh, we are running testing at, um, at OS level, as I said, so just validate a CPI, CPU frequency management, power management, NUMA, and also uh, virtualization behaviors of the, of the platform, just to be sure that we, we are not losing any features and that, uh, that it has been turned on properly. And then we test also storage and we are running performance benchmark to check if there is uh, no issues like LINPAC or networking benchmarks or IO benchmarks just to validate that everything goes well. So the CI is currently run um, as a community project just to give you a rough idea. So each node costs about 700, 000, uh, 700 US dollars. And um, the, the project is part of the Linux Foundation. So Linux Boot is a Linux Foundation project. And we are working with the foundation on how to set up properly uh, the business model associated with the Linux Boot CI. We want to keep it open and free 
and uh, we want to have as many people willing to use it to be able to do it. And uh, that's, uh, that's still a challenge that we are uh, working on. So we have 20 servers which are currently allocated to that program and we are expanding them. So there will be um, probably 40 servers in California within the next couple of months. And we are going to increase the number of machines also in, uh, in Europe. So uh, as I said, everything is on GitHub. So you can directly go to the GitHub account on Linux boot and uh, participate to the project, commit code, and have a look to it. And as a conclusion, I think what is really key within the firmware is just to reach this goal. So keep them open, and that's, that's I think, really important. So security shouldn't, shouldn't close uh, firmware, and I think it's, uh, it's key. And we have, a, we have a lot of ongoing debate regarding uh, firmware signatures and who has the control on, uh, on the firmware. And uh, I think being, being able to update the firmware uh, during the life cycle of a machine is, is really important. Um, repro and being reproducible is also key because um, when we build a firmware, so we can see that in some cases it's not updating for many years. And uh, if we have to rebuild it and just to understand what's going on and what might be going wrong, with a, with a specific build. So we, we need to be able to, uh, to rebuild uh, an aging firmware. So being flexible is, um, is really key, and that's why we like to have Linux uh, kernel within the firmware, and the resiliency is something also very important. I have, let's take some risk. Uh, so it might be crashing. Okay, I lost my network connection. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> that's always the same. <laughs> Uh, let me check if I can get back my Wi-Fi, I think. So I, what I wanted to show you roughly was, um, was a node which is running Linux boot. So you can see the, the system. So it, wa it was booted in uh, data for data centers in uh, Marcusi. And I can get access to the console and uh, can turn on and off the, the system remotely uh, through either the API or Y being directly connected to the node. So which means that I don't need any specific hardware to be a firmware developer. So I can, I can launch a build from my laptop through a web API, and that, that build can be directly uh, tested uh, locally on the machine. Let me check if it still works. Uh, I need to kill that. I don't know if you have any question why I'm restarting that. Uh, right, right now, I think the kernel uh, is about two megabytes, and the user space is around three. For uh, the kernel and the runtime, and that includes uh, PGP and um, uh, LVM2 and crypt setup and a bunch of other things. Oh no! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So I have been able to shut down the, the node, and so let's try to restart it. Just to give you a rough estimation, so that's a server which is hosting your dual Xeon. It has to initialize QPI bus, run um, the memory training uh, program, and then after um, putting uh, the operating system. So I just turn it on, and you can see the boot of uh, Linux boot coming up. I hope it will go up to the end. So, so that's the kernel. So we, we booted a dual socket Xeon servers just right here in less than 20 seconds. Yeah, the stock firmware, I think, takes about uh, seven minutes to get to the, the point of actually yeah. starting to look for grub. Um, there is, there is a just one hint. So currently, I'm building um, the, the systems with a single core. So that's a, that's a 20 core machine. So it's not, it's not booting in uh, SMP mode. But when we are running the KIXX, the new kernel is, is run in uh, SMP mode. So it, it does initialize all the cores. But even if we are initializing all the cores, so we, we are still running in a very fast way. So this is just the build that we, we are testing currently. 
So some of the command are not there because this is um, we are we are really space constraints. So that's the that's the thing. And um, uh, what else? So you can see that there is 64 gig of main memory there, and we are able to start the machine in less than 20 seconds. One of the goals of the project is also to be able to shut down unused machines and being able to restart them um, just uh, in the early morning. So there is a lot of servers which are totally useless during the night. And I get the basic dreams, which is uh, either turning them in S3 mode or um, directly shutting them down. And when you discuss with hyperscalers, they are extremely worried about the fact that the machine is not able to restart the day after. And even a 1% failure is still extremely high to their level because they have to restart thousands of nodes. And we need to prove that uh, we, we can be, um, we are able to restart the machines in a very efficient way. So that's the, that's the other things. Yeah, so I have a question about the security. You said that the focus is security and that sort of stuff. Uh, but you pull in like a two megabyte kernel, which is full of bloat, basically. And uh, aren't you concerned about the attack surface of that compared to, uh, let's say, some other bootloader, which can be stripped down to like 100K? So it's a great question about, you know, do we consider having Linux in our TCB to be a, a security threat? And the fact of the matter is Linux is in our TCB. We're going to be running Linux as the, as the OS anyway. Hmm. So uh, having the network stack that we depend on, having the device drivers that we depend on, having the file system parsers that we already depend on, uh, and being able to share those between the bootloader and the, uh, the operating system that's going to be running, uh, in a way, it, it's, it's a reduction in the, the TCB. Because um, now we're not dealing with both Linux's device drivers and Grub's device drivers and uh, UEFI's device driver. Uh, we only have the one to depend on. Yeah, I believe that's different because you can update the kernel that's running on the system, but can you update the Linux boot itself? Yes. Yeah. That, that's one of the key tenants is that the users can always build their own kernels and uh, the, the ability to do that sort of self-help to patch and apply them. So we have uh, Linux boot firmware that is now Meltdown and Spectre safe, which uh, you know, most vendors have not yet uh, produced. Can you speak about that a little, how this update of the Linux boot works when you have a security fix? Uh, right now, it, it's very site-specific. Um, most of the laptops are, uh, the users flash their own, and then they have to reseal their uh, TPM keys. Um, most of the hyperscale open compute systems, they can flash the firmware uh, via the BMC. So in, we've sort of shifted the responsibility of that uh, to, to a different system. So then there is the buggy BMC, basically. Yes, which is then the big concern of how do we protect the BMC. And moving things like micro BMC uh, over there um, so we can have uh, a little bit better system. Um, most of the ARM systems at least give us a good way to get a measured boot uh, from an on-die boot ROM that we, we don't have right now on, on x86. So uh, in, in some ways, I feel better about moving our root of trust uh, down there. Yeah, OK, thanks. So <laughs> right now you're he can wait. <laughs> right now your starting point is the FSP from Intel, or is a ROM uh, a complete BIOS that you strip down later on the boot um, part? Right now the starting point is um, is an existing system BIOS. Um, but we work with Intel and the OCP Foundation to start from the FSP. And the Intel has just modified uh, their FSP license and redistribution license uh, based on the work we are doing uh, within the OCP Foundation. So this has been announced about two weeks or three weeks ago. So uh, you are able to download FSP for many platforms directly from GitHub. And there is a license which allows you to redistribute that. So the only one constraint uh, is that you commit not to reverse engineer the content of the FSP, which is acceptable, we think. Yeah, there is some moral compromise compared to the totally free uh, core boot or libre boot uh, model, but it's a compromise that lets us run on modern hardware and on server platforms. Um, and the folks at Intel are. Uh, 
we have some allies in the firmware space that are trying to uh, make things more open and more documented. And as Jean-Marie pointed out, they did just recently amend uh, the licensing to be uh, compatible with, uh, with free software uh, firmware images. Uh, we, we have not been looking at AMD yet. Grant? What does distribution support look like for Linux boot systems? Uh, cubes runs really nicely. Okay, so uh, I mean, <laughs> or what I mean is, I mean, for distributing images or bootable images, all of it is oriented around EFI or BIOS systems right now. What does it look like for a distro to have official support for a Linux boot system? So I think we have two different uh, uh, Grub parsers that can attempt to parse the command lines for the ISO images to be able to uh, boot them and run. Um, most of them do need a, uh, to be told that the IO MMU is already enabled because we, we turn that on very early in the boot process. Um, but beyond that, uh, PS Stock, Ubuntu, and Debian uh, can be booted. Um, I think we, no, I, I'm sure about that. So we, we have been able also to boot on CentOS. So, but right now we, we do not have established direct uh, relationship with the distro vendor. So we are just running testing uh, by ourselves. Right. Uh, that's, uh, that's something which should happen in the 2019 timeframe, something like that. So we are just validating that everything works properly on our side. And that's easier to convince somebody to support a new technology if you can come up with a demo which works instead of coming up with a great idea and telling to the guy, okay, can I offload you the work? <laughs> so that's the, that's the thing. So we, we had some uh, bad time with Ubuntu so, but this was coming from uh, the stock kernel configuration from the installer, so we fixed that, and uh, we are able to boot straight forward CentOS without any issue or, or Debian. Don't speak about Windows. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't support. Well, what are you supporting Windows? <laughs> we, we don't support Windows yet, uh, right now. So. If, if if uh, we can boot pretty much any multi-boot compliant uh, OS. So, for instance, Zen uh, is bootable. Um, if, uh, if legacy OS vendors want to uh, add support for that sort of thing, um, we're happy to work with them to try to make it work. I have to throw that in the attendance, so everybody's awake. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to have it on your head. <laughs> Do you have a Grant, question? Can we get the, uh, yeah. Grant, we need we the, the mic on the other side. I don't know who has it. Who's got the mic? Uh, hello? Grant. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that way. <laughs> yeah, but I think they are recording, so that's why you need it. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, like, do you guys do all the, like, post checks that, like, regular BIOSes do? Like, uh, like memory tests to make sure that uh, memory is not prob problematic, that it detects the right amount of memory, and all the smart tests along with all the like system tests that normal BIOSes do, or do you just skip that part and just rely on the kernel to? No, we, we, are, we are able to run memory tests. So the thing is we, we, have, we have a special build which is a running memory test in parallel using the stream benchmark. And then we are checking the system event log to validate if there has been some uh, a memory error or not during the during the testing. So one of the benefits is that we can scan the global memory in a far less faster way than traditional BIOS. Yeah, we, we can move this into user space yeah. uh, or user space kernel space. So rather than having to have a custom firmware one, you know, we, we can we can move it to a site specific decision about when, how often, how much stress, and so on. We are, All right. We are running out of time. Yeah. <laughs> Nico, you'll have to take this up with us uh, afterwards. You know, uh, is it risky to give people access to your machines, full access with firmware that you inject and run? To our machine? Yes. We don't think so. I don't care. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't hear you. Okay. Octane. Um, and, once uh, Linux supports it, we'll we'll support it. Okay. So like the persistent memory stuff. Yeah. That. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.